Last week's Paris Air Show was a historic one for Airbus. They sold hundreds of new planes and secured the single biggest aircraft order by volume in history. Of course, all the folks at Airbus want to take a second to pause and enjoy the victory. But in this fast-moving industry, everyone else is asking, what's next? Well, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Stan Sparberg, who leads up commercial marketing at Airbus, to find out exactly that. We explored a variety of topics, including unreleased aircraft like the A220 Stretch and A380 Neo. So, without further ado, let's dive into it and glimpse into the future of Airbus. Can you introduce yourself to the people at home and tell them what it is that you do? Sure. I'm Stan Sparberg. I'm Head of Marketing for Commercial Aircraft at Airbus. And so I make sure that we represent the voice of the customers within Airbus. So we basically listen to the customer and we, we need to make sure that our offering, whether it's services or product, is representative of what the market needs. So Stan, um, been a big air show for Airbus. Can you kind of give me the highlights of what we've seen so far? Well, I think you know, definitely one of the nicer air shows that I've been to. I think we had a lot of customer engagements, a lot of people that really came you know, to see our product. But back to the air shows, it's all about orders, right? And sure. we're pretty happy to be walking away with quite a, <laughs> quite a good number of orders. Sure. It might be actually a record. That 500 aircraft Indigo well, deal was a record, right? Well, definitely that is, but also the number of aircraft sold mm -hmm. during the air show by one OEM. I'm not sure if we're exactly there, but I think it might be close. I think some people thought, coming into the show, that you folks might announce an A220-500, right? Right. That seems like it's not going to come to fruition. We're several days into the show now, and nothing has been announced. And perhaps that shouldn't be a surprise, because Airbus leadership has been very explicit that you weren't going to launch a stretched A220 until the timing is right. So, what needs to happen? What conditions need to be met before you feel confident in stretching the A220 further? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. I think we said it and the line that was used before, it's not if but when and the timing has to be right. Has there been some requests from customers on a stretch? By the way, we don't call it a 500, we call it a stretch. Mm -hmm. Has there been some demand on stretch? Absolutely. Um, so we are studying our options, but we'll need to really understand what would be the right capacity, what would be the right range. Sure. And, and of course, how can we make sure that we've got the, you know, the engine choice, which would be ideally our preference to have engine choice like we do on the 320. But again, the focus today is definitely on getting the 100 and 300 sorted out. We have a lot of demand for both of those aircraft, so that's the focus of the teams. Let's talk about the 100 and the 300. Sure. Because they are very, very interesting aircraft, right? They're opening up these new long, thin routes that weren't possible before. Absolutely. And because of that, the sales potential is sky high. That being said, they are a little bit of oddballs in the Airbus lineup in that you adopted them from Bombardier and they don't match uh, some of the other aircraft, especially when it comes to maintenance and cockpit commonality, which is a pillar of Airbus's products, right? An A320 pilot can easily be trained on a 330 and a 350, but that's not the case for the 320. Right, right. So my question for you is, have you seen that as an inhibitor to adoption of the A220 type across Airbus customers? And if so, what do you do as a cockpit redesign, for instance, in the cards? Well, first of all, let me agree with you. I think 100 and 300 are really great planes, and we're getting an amazing feedback across three main sort of elements. Well, customer experience, you know, it's got windows larger than 777. It's got more windows per row, which makes that aircraft very really light and bright and wide. So we don't even call it an original aircraft. It, it's really a narrow body. On the other end, as you said, operationally, it's able to do what the competition cannot. So you've got sure. the wrench advantages, you've got an amazing, you know, 25% less cost, less CO2. So as I said, you know, today, the commonality, you're right, it's not there with the 320s. And we haven't had any major issues with the fact that there's no commonality with the 320 or 321 family. Sure. Now, would it be a, on a wish list of airlines? Absolutely. Is it something that we would execute? Um, at the moment, I, would, I wouldn't think so. Talking about redesigns that actually have happened with the A220, a few weeks ago you announced that you're refreshing the plane's interior. And I think that caught some folks by surprise. People already love the A220, and I think as the old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Right? Now the biggest change that's coming to the A220 is that you're replacing the pivot bins, which fold up and out and give the cabin this sense of space with a fixed bin that ostensibly would reduce the amount of airiness or, or room in the cabin. 
Can you explain to me the rationale behind making that decision, making that change? Sure. I think the mindset at Airbus has always been, we listen to our customers, we get the feedback, and then we try to address what we're hearing from the market. When we introduce the large XL beans on the 320 family, we had a lot of positive feedback because everyone can bring their roller bag. I mean, I mean, you're based in North America, you know how important it is for the Americans <laughs> to, to bring their bags and have their bags on, on board. So it was a result of a feedback that we received from our customers. Sure. Now, when, you, when you're able to increase your space by 20% and at the same time, you know, not increase weight, obviously that is something that's adding a lot of value to our customers. So that's why this is done. Now, maybe to give you a little bit of a insights into how we do those things, what we do is typically we start consulting with our airlines a lot earlier. So we had a lot of consultation. In Hamburg last year, we were already talking to some of the airlines and showing it to them. Our concern was exactly the same. Would it be as spacious as today? And to be honest, the feedback we got, it actually looks very spacious with the, with the XL bins, with all the additional you know, benefits that you're receiving with extra space. Sure. So almost a no-brainer. And what was interesting, I'm quoting a few people from the current AAX that we just had in Hamburg. I had a number of people that said to me, I said, what was the highlight of the show? They said it was the XL bins on the 220. When will those XL bins actually make it into service? Are they in being installed in production aircraft right now? No, so today we have slots. So if you're, if you're looking at you know, buying a, a 220, you'd be looking at somewhere in the 26. So by the time you need to, you, know, you can purchase a new aircraft, those bins would be available. We're looking at potentially also end of 25 okay. for availability of the XL bins. Let's move up market, talk about the A320. Sure. The thing is an absolute smash hit. Its backlog has grown to over 8,000 units at this point, right. and it's the star of the show. Historic 500 unit order from Indigo, all of those orders are firm. Correct. Obviously that's a testament to its place in the market, but now if you're a new customer, and you place an order for an A320, you might not be able to receive that jet for a long time. Do you see that hurting the marketability of the aircraft and what do you do to address that? Well, I think definitely this, this side of the decade, we're probably not going to have any slots available, production slots available very soon. Um, certainly if we go into the 30s, there's plenty of availability. And as you know, we're ramping up our production to rate 75. So we will have capacity to, for the new aircraft to be delivered off the line. But the other thing that's important to note, we have a lot of aircraft that are also with our leasing customers. And so if you're talking about a leasing opportunity for a 320 family aircraft today, you still have slots in 24 and 25. Sure. Again, to me, it's a testament to the success of this particular program and the fact that we're receiving orders and, and people are committing to it on a longer term basis. As you said, it is a firm commitment in, in the case of Indigo and some of the other customers. To me, it just confirms that it's the right product. It addresses the right needs. NPS scores of, you know, close to 75. By the way, that's the same for the 220. Yeah. And for me as a passenger, you know, I always, I am proud to be part of Airbus, but when you get on board of one of those, one of those aircraft and, and you experience, it's just something that um, gives us that extra, extra level of proudness, yeah. if I may say. It didn't achieve that success for no reason. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. The last member of the A320 family, the XLR, it hasn't come out yet, airlines are incredibly excited to get their hands on it, but it's recently experienced some delays and first delivery has been pushed back. Can you explain to us where we stand in product certification? Sure. I mean, at the moment, we're very committed to have that aircraft entry into service in Q224, and we've made a lot of progress with the certification authorities. Of course, our biggest priority has always been safety. Sure. So we're never gonna compromise any safety-related elements and we need to make sure that we work very closely with the, with the authorities to address those. You may have seen some recent interviews from our heads of programs where we're basically now confirming that we are comfortable with the technical solutions that we've sort of committed to and also that we're not going to be compromising our range and performance of the aircraft that we've agreed with our customers. A lot of them were very happy to see it doing sure. some flying over here. We've done plenty of testing. We just did the cold you know, weather testing in Canada. You probably have seen our 13-hour flight mm -hmm. around France where we sort of did the XLR, yeah. you know, print. Testament to its range. That's right, testament yeah. to its range. Very happy with the way uh, the testing is going. Very happy with that aircraft. And, of course, having 550 orders over 25 operators, sure. it's already a proven, you know, it's not a niche product of course. from my perspective. Yeah. yeah, and when it's so important to your product stack and so important to the market, 
it's better to take your time to get it right. Absolutely. Right? And, and as I said, for us, it's always been safety, number one. We don't compromise on safety. And secondly, understanding the customer needs and really making sure that whatever we are providing is addressing the needs of our customers. Moving up to the wide bodies. Right. I actually want to start by talking about the A350 rather than the A330. And uh, it'll make sense why in a second. Okay, I'm fine with that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the A350 won a pretty significant order during the show. Nine 1000s are going to Philippines. Correct. And during the press conference, it was revealed that those aircraft and economy are going to be tenebrast. Correct. And that kind of breaks the seal when it comes to mainline carriers on that high density configuration. Up to this point, it was only leisure carriers who had operated tenebrast. So now that the floodgates have opened, do you see more mainliners adopting this tenebrast setup or is it going to stay reserved primarily for those leisure low cost carriers? Look, again, coming back to this mentality of continuous improvement and listening to our customers, of course, we've done quite a major upgrade to our 350 platform. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've basically took two inches of each side, so we've made the cabin much wider. We've made it longer as well. We've reduced some weight. So I believe in the cu current configuration, Tenebrest is really starting to make sense. And we are now seeing it from one carrier, and I'm sure there'll be, there'll be more to come. Sure. To, your, to your question, whether the sort of full service carriers would be adopting it as well as the low low cost carriers i believe so i think it makes a lot of sense economically it also from it's not a compromised passenger experience i mean we have plenty of times where we have our customers come into the mock-up they test the seats they compare it to the you know other competing seats that are flying out there and and obviously we're seeing that it's not a compromised solution and we're going to have a lot more 350s flying in the Tenebras configuration. They're flying in a much quieter cabin on the 350, sure. low cabin altitude, and to be honest, you know, talking to some of the flight attendants, uh, which operate both fleets, uh, we get quite a lot of feedback that they enjoy working on the 350 a lot more than they do on the competition product. Yeah, it's, it's about more than just cabin width, right? Oh, absolutely. Mood lighting, big windows, good cabin pressurization, very quiet. Exactly. Um, so there's more to the equation there. Absolutely. But what we've adjusted, as I said, that was mainly related to the cabin width sure. and also reducing some of the weight. To that point of widening the cabin, it sounds like a, a big driver of that is to increase the versatility, the revenue generation potential of the aircraft for your customers. Absolutely. If you look at the A330, the little brother, you know, it won a big order during the show, but it is still lagging the 787 pretty significantly in sales. And there are a couple of airlines mainly in uh, Southeast Asia, who do actually fly that plane in a high density configuration, but it hasn't been widely adopted. If this experiment with Tenebrest on the A350 ends up being a success, do you see a world in which you might invest more time and effort into widening the cabin of the A330, since you guys have already invested in things like increasing the mTOW, improving the engine? Is that a path that you might take? Maybe. To, to counter you a little bit on this 78330 um, you know, parallel that you've drawn, we are very proud of the heritage of the 330 family. And we've sold over 1,700 aircraft you know, of the 330 family. NEO came in a lot later, of course. We've only you know, five years into the production of our NEO. And we're very proud that we already delivered our hundreds NEO out there. The feedback that we're getting, it's a very versatile platform. It already has the best seat mile cost out there. Mm. So is there a demand for and you know, a sort of a, a more dense configuration of the 330 that we're seeing out there? I wouldn't say so, because mm -hmm. it's so good already. Of course, the low cost carriers, I mean, Cebu Pacific, for example, we've showcased their aircraft at uh, Singapore Air Show last year. When people were thinking, okay, 451 seats on a 330, how would that look like? But it actually looks great. And um, so I think that the options are there. Would we consider to, to do it to the 330neo? I don't think so. I think 330 already has all the elements to be a very, very successful platform. And th there's still a wave of um, renewals that, that are going to come to the 330-200s. Uh, that, that's been slowed down by COVID a little bit. So that's probably why we haven't seen you know, it pick up just yet. Sure. But I'm pretty sure that that will be picking up very soon. And we're actually increasing our production rates on both 330 and 350 because we see the amount of demand out there. Sure. Speaking of demand for wide bodies, last week, Tim Clark of Emirates was quoted saying that he would love you folks to still build an A380neo. Now, the A380 production line shut down a couple of years ago, but 
you know, we're now in this market where people need the A380. We're seeing plenty of airlines pulling them out of storage and deploying them on marquee routes. Right. Is there any world in which Airbus considers an A380neo or is that program completely in the past? For me, again, it comes back to the requirements of the market, to requirements of our customers. And today, the important thing for them, for them is to have this balance of risk and, you know, and revenue that they can generate with a, with a particular aircraft. For us, what we're seeing is certainly there is demand for replacing first class. Mm. And three, 380s were in a lot of carriers where there was a first class offering. So that's why we introduced a first class offering on our 350-1000. Mm. And also, you may have seen Lufthansa recently released theirs. Sure. You've seen Qantas you know, showing what they, their one would look like on the Sunrise project. So I, I think as long as we can have first class, we can have enough premium, you know, premium class seats and the standard breast configuration allows us to have 30 more seats in the economy. I think the 351 Salmon is poised really well to get a lot of the replacement market of the 777s and the 380s. Now, my favorite plane as a passenger is a 380. Mm -hmm. And we're still very proud of the 380 as our family member. Sure. Now, it is in the past. I don't believe personally that it'll come back. But as I said, the focus of Airbus is to listen to its customers and then make sure that we can address their needs. Yeah. And I believe today with the 351 Southern, 350 900 and the 330 Neo, we have an amazing family of wide body aircraft that could address the needs of all the different you know, business models that are out there. So Stan, to wrap things up, yeah. when you think about the future right. of Airbus, think about the future of this company, what is it that gets you most excited? Yeah, I think of it a lot, you know. I mean, what gets me up in the morning is the fact that I think aviation is extremely, extremely important. You know, you know my family lives in Australia, and I'd like to go and visit my family, and th there's no way I could do that without having, you know, the means of aviation. So I'm extremely excited about the fact that this is a very relevant industry to the future because it connects the world, it allows for G GDP growth, it enables cultural exchanges. It enables me to go home and see my, my family. Uh, so I'd like to see that, that growing. But one thing that gets me really excited is that at Airbus, we're trying to connect today and tomorrow. Mm. We're on a mission to connect today and tomorrow. We're going through a major decarbonization transformation of our industry. We've really taken the leading role and being this catalyst of all the ideas. We're investing a lot of money into understanding how can we breach the gap between where we are today and where we should be in by 2050. And I certainly want to you know, look my grandkids in, in their eyes and, and sort of say, I've done my bit you know, in making sure that it wasn't just about you know, great air show with great orders, but it was also about the vision that we're presenting out there and talking about to our customers, to the ecosystem, to the regulators. And, and hopefully they'll say, yeah, you did, you did, you did good for us. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what that future looks like. Stan, Same here. Thanks appreciate so much, it Kobe. so much. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you. So that's what you can expect from Airbus in the near future. If you enjoyed this conversation, well, you're in luck. I did a similar one with Boeing's head of commercial marketing, which you can watch right here. And I've got more of these conversations coming out very soon. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss them. Thanks again to Stan for being so generous with his time and expertise. And until I see you again, don't forget to look up.